Hi, welcome to the Reed Foundation with Better series. I'm Julie Lubinsky, Web Manager for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. You will have a chance to ask questions at the end of the presentation using the chat feature at the bottom of the web portion of the webinar, um, or by asking uh, through your phone line after we open up the line. So make sure um, you know if you're called in, you, you can call in um, the number posted in your registration confirmation. Today's webinar is Adapting Life with Candace Cable. She is a pioneer in the sport of wheelchair racing and a 12-time Paralympic medalist who now attends the Paralympic Olympic Games as a journalist. She is also a contributing member to the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation online community. She writes blogs within the Life After Paralysis section for over four years now. She also represented the Reeve Foundation during the CRPD event at the United Nations. And we are so happy that she is able to do these webinars for us once a month and has absolutely fantastic guests. Um, today is another one of those days, um, and she had to change on the fly. So I'm going to hand it over to Candice and let her begin her webinar. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Julie. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, for this this uh, webinar, Adapting Life. That's part of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation Live Better series. You know, it's a series that really gives us a lot of opportunities to learn new skills on how we can adapt our own lives by learning how other people are living their lives. And, and once we have that information, you know, those are things that we're going to need as we age because we're all aging. And as we age, we're adapting. And, and that's a, a real key piece of staying healthy, staying active, and contributing members to our communities, you know, to the areas we live, to a community like this and, and other ones. And, and our previous guest that we were supposed to have today, Ashley Lynn Olson, unfortunately broke her leg just over the weekend and cannot be our guest today. We were going to be talking about wheelchairtraveling.com. But we are going to go with the flow of breaking legs because I also have a broken leg right now. And one of my gurus through this so far six-week series of healing has been Bob Vogel. And Bob is just a, I mean, this guy is a gem. He's a wealth of knowledge. And he called me just touching base with me saying, hi, how's, how's life going the day after I was injured. And from then on, he's been checking in on me constantly about how's it going and giving me tips and information. Because Bob, you know, Bob really has a super passion for living. And he is a, and has been always a very, very active guy. In the early 1980s, he was placing consistently in national championship competitions as a freestyle skier. And he was a part of the Screen Actors Guild. His membership created opportunities to be a stuntman in the movie uh, Hot Dog, which if you haven't seen, you need to see it. It's a classic. And anybody who goes to see it with a group of people must dress in 80s attire for skiing. Now, when Bob was 25 in 1985, he had a spinal cord injury at the T10 level. It was a huge crash, and it really changed his life. But it didn't stop him from being active. Bob has continued to, con to constantly change the way people think by living by the idea that there are no limits on your perception, and you can always jump past whatever someone else's limits are on you. He earned his bachelor's degree with honors in broadcast communication and has won an Emmy. And he's also the senior correspondent for New Mobility magazine. He is writing about all aspects of life for people with disabilities. And his writing really takes us to a vast variety of places. And one of the things about Bob that I really love is that he, if he doesn't know something, he's jumping in on it. So today we're going to talk about bone fractures, and we're going to talk about, you know, the things that, that happen to us with spinal cord injuries and what we can do to be better prepared. And we're using my bone fracture as an example uh, through the slides that we're going to use here. But it's also more information on down the line of how we can keep our bones strong and healthy. Because my doctor says I have ghost bones right now. And so I'm working really hard to be able to to be able to build them back up and 
So I want everybody to help me welcome Bob Vogel here, our guru on health and wellness. Welcome, Bob. Hey, Candace. Thanks for having me. Wow, what a great introduction. <laughs> I'm blushing. Well, how do you even touch near what you're up to? And, of course, he's a father also, which is, you know, amazing beyond belief in its own place. Definitely the most rewarding and biggest challenge so far. Yeah, so um, let's talk about your fractures that you've had, and we'll bring mine up on the screen so that everybody can go ooh and ah to them, uh, because uh, one of the things that I learned with uh, with this fracture that I have on my tibia plateau and the fibula is that the fracture I had with my femur and the rod that they put in actually created the force that buckled the tibia plateau when I fell out of my chair. So that was really interesting for me, and I'm I'm wondering with uh, with all the the different fractures you're going to tell us about that you've had, um, is there any hardware that you still have in your body? Um, yeah, there is, and and it's interesting because I've been talking about my fractures now. I, I just cringe because I can't believe. Well, first of all, I have this this crazy active lifestyle. I mean, everything from as you saw, off road hand cycling to mono skiing to hang gliding at 20,000 feet and aerobatic hang gliding, you name it, I do it. Um, and yet, uh, and so my fractures uh, in 1989, um, when mono skiing was in its infancy and the suspension wasn't that good, um, I, uh, I skied into a huge rut and I bottomed out the mono, my mono ski shock so bad that um, I, uh, I basically fractured my sacrum. I drove it right through my hips. So I fractured that, the whole sacral area and um, with no sensation. I didn't even know it. Who knows? But I think having right. I have uh, Harrington rods. I have rod, metal rods that fuse my spine from uh, T6 to L2. Um, I have a feeling with those long rods, anybody that's got long rods, that that's like a whole bunch of vertebrae that don't have little discs that can do a little bit of compression. So I don't know, but I think having those long rods may have contributed to that fracture. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know when I did it that I had done it. I skied down the mountain. I you know, went to the awards ceremony. I just didn't feel very good. And Anyway, over the next few days, I... I really didn't feel very good, and I went, and when I uh, when I got x-rayed, I laid down, and everything lined up, and they said, no, it looks perfect, and then I went back a couple of days later and said, no, I really don't look, feel good, and this time they said, oh, yeah, you might have something that's a little bit out of place. Well, it turns out it was a major fracture. Unfortunately, the doctors didn't take it seriously, and um, I should have been in traction. Instead, they just said, no, nope, just go home, go on about your life, and... Um, because of that, my spine healed really, really crooked and really bad. Um, and but just uh, to go through the list, I, it's terrible. I feel like evil can evil. <laughs> that, that's well, the well, only. Well, I just want to yeah. touch base on that that whole piece that you just talked about, um, and then move on to the list. Is is that there is a, there is a a real danger and a real problem with the medical profession in that because we can't feel things, then we're not able to articulate what they need to hear, which is how something feels. And if things don't look odd to them, they won't investigate it further and you continue to, to get sicker or, or you know, the fracture continues to get worse. And, and, and that is, that's, a, that's a really big piece, I think, of the equation. It, it's part of what, what happened to me with this one. Um, but for people with spinal cord injuries, I think we have to become really educated advocates that say, no, I really believe there's something wrong here. We need to look deeper. And so I really appreciate that you, you touched base on that and, uh, and brought that forth because I think that that's like the first thing that happens is that we can't feel it. And that was what was with mine is I couldn't feel it. And, but then I saw the swelling. And then I started to actually physically feel bad, and um, and nobody really wants to ever acknowledge that they they fractured a bone. I think so. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so so the list. Let's hear the list. That's what I want. I'm. Oh well, I mean, actually, I let's, you you <laughs> brought up something that I brought up, so I'll go through the list. But let's since we're focused uh-huh. on this, that is super important because I, I I let me explain what happened to me, and hopefully it'll prevent it from happening to anybody else. Um, I uh, I went to a major. Um, we won't name names, but I went to a major um, spinal cord rehab center where I got x-rayed and everything. And um, I was actually sent to the head um, uh, physical medicine and rehab specialist. Uh, Unfortunately, a couple years earlier, he and I had gone kind of head-to-head. We had butted heads about something. And um, so... So you didn't have a good relationship? Yeah. What had happened was he said, oh, you're doing all these crazy sports. You're going to get injured, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I'm also getting uh, straight A's in college, and I'm successful, and I'm healthy and everything. And so um, when I got hurt, I I don't know what happened, but he pretty much ignored it. And um, I the last thing I wanted was to be in traction. And um, he he essentially met with his staff, and they said, uh, you know, I kind of think they said this guy's crazy and he's nuts. Let's just let him go home. He'll be fine. And uh, I should have been in traction or something should have been done. Nothing was done and the whole area was unstable. I could actually feel it moving up and down. But I was only injured for a few years and I didn't know what that meant. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, I even asked one of his interns because I was really worried and I came back one day and asked, should I get a second opinion? And his intern was so scared of him that he said, oh, no, he's the best in the business. I would not recommend getting a second opinion because they're all going to tell you the same thing. Right there, that's the biggest red flag on the planet. If a doctor says you shouldn't get a second opinion, um, wheel as fast as you can to get a second opinion. Um, right, because right. Anybody, you should be open, right. It's yeah, 2020 20 hindsight, yeah. every other physician that looked at that fracture you know, years later said, you know, the worst thing you could have ever done would be sit upright with that um, injury, and that's why it healed so incorrectly. So um, uh, hopefully you're getting really good information when this happens, but if you don't or something feels a little weird or whatever, it's super important to get a second and a third opinion. And good doctors will encourage that because uh, if they're good doctors, it makes them feel really good. If they're not sure, it makes them, uh, it, it, it's a win-win. So um, anyway. Right, and, and, and you know, and the, the other piece of that is that the majority of the mainstream doctors that are out there that we're all going to be in touch with, because very few of us live close to a, you know, a rehab center that deals with spinal cord injury, and that clearly is their, you know, is their specialty. So we're going to have doctors that aren't familiar with spinal cord injury, aren't familiar with disability, and and those doctors really aren't getting educated on a yearly basis when they do their renewals of their certifications. So it, it is a critical piece, and I'm really glad you brought that up about seeking out that second opinion because, because we are going to get a standard of care that doctors are used to doing, which is what I experienced in the very beginning, rather than a personal type of care that is directed just at us. And we really do need that because with a spinal cord injury, we have a lot of other things that come into play that um, I want to touch on after we get that list from you, which one was autonomic dysreflexia. So let's get that list, and I want to jump into that, you know, the dysreflexia because that one was definitely something I didn't see coming. And actually... Lynn Olson also experienced it, and we're both low para. So, so that was that was a big surprise. So, I want to hear that list, though. I got I got okay. To talk so, now. so here comes the list. So that was the only one that's sports related. So here I am doing all these just insane, crazy, rough and tumble sports. Uh, you know, wheelchair football, you name it. Nothing. Uh, but then, then. Two years later, um, I did a spiral fracture of my left femur, um, and it was actually on a big hang gliding trip. I was sitting on the edge of a bed uh, in the evening, and I had one leg crossed over the other, taking off a shoe, um, and I fell forward. And uh, so it put uh, it put torque on the leg, and all of a sudden there was um, 
a snap mm-hmm. like as if you were breaking a um, uh, like a two by four made out of balsa wood, and my leg suddenly moved suddenly, and and I got this oh. uh, that adrenaline, the dry mouth, and and the um, the metallic taste, and like something really bad happened, and I and I knew something bad happened, but I said no, this is not possible. I sat up in bed and I carefully felt one leg with my hand, everything was fine, and then I carefully felt the other leg, and when I got to the middle of the femur, because my muscles are flaccid, um, I could I could feel the, the, the entire spiral, I could feel the two parts of the femur separated, and then I really felt sick. Um, and then I went to a local hospital, and the, um, the physician was really helpful, but uh, things like they you know, fit me with a soft splint, and I like, well, how does that feel? And, and I, as you know, right. I said, well, um, by taking my hands and putting it in the <laughs> leg, I can tell you that my hands feel that it's loose, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the first one. So now we got, now we have two fractures. Then um, uh, within seven years of the injury, then in 2000, so now 15 uh years later, um, I, uh, let's say I was having a nice amorous romp with my wife, <laughs> and one leg got caught in the uh, edge of the covers where the covers are tucked in the edge of the bed there, the end of the bed, and somehow during having a good time, I must have turned, and um, I broke my hip, the uh, the trochanter, the bone that goes from the hip to the uh, the ball of the hip broken half. I didn't know it. About three hours later, I woke up and I felt like I had a bladder infection and had a dry mouth and probably was dysreflexic and uh, sat on the edge of the bed and just kind of checked things and I pushed on my right leg and it went back and forth about an inch and went click, click and I immediately knew what had happened and I I, I, uh, just a reaction. I just, I I puked into the garbage can because it was so horrendous. Um, Again there, though, I went uh, to a local hospital, had a great surgeon who kind of gave me the options, and it was kind of crazy. I'm sitting there, and he says, well, we can uh, can put screws in it and try and fix it, or we can uh, do a girdle stone where you just lop off the the head of the femur and um, you know, lop off the ball there, which just sounded barbaric, or we can give you an artificial hip. I'm just lying there, you know, and, and we should do this within the next 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, my gosh. I was very fortunate that I had a good friend that was a PM and R doctor, and I called him on a Saturday morning, and he said, well, you, you can put screws in the hip first. That's your easiest. If it doesn't work, then you have two other options. So he put four screws and put the hip together, and it was together perfectly. Um, here's where a doctor needs to know about spinal cord injury. When I was done, I said, uh, the next day I woke up, uh, like woke up out of surgery, no pain, everything's fine, everything's perfect. He says, yep, surgery went great, showed me an x-ray. I said, what should I do to keep this safe and healthy and heal? And he said, you have really no restrictions. It should heal in six to eight weeks. He says, uh, in my non-disabled patients, I get them up on a walker within a couple days. And, um, you know, they're fine. Uh, not thinking that they have hip muscles that are constantly compressing that area. Um, with me, with, with any of us with no hip muscle, um, it turned out whenever I transferred into a vehicle that was a little higher than my chair or a new bed mm-hmm. we had just gotten that was a little higher than my chair, my leg hung on those screws. And within four weeks, uh, the soft screws pulled out of the bone. The whole thing pulled apart. Um, I came in telling the doctor it was making some noise. He said, oh, they do that. And he had an x-ray taken, and he came back and went, oh, expletive. And um, oh, yep. he pulled apart. He says, well, your two options are now, you know, cut the, the ball, the, the femur off, which is a girdle stone or an artificial hip, and I was ready to get an artificial hip. All I knew about then was the the baseball player, Bo Jackson, had an artificial hip. <laughs> Sweet. You know, I could play Major League Baseball. So 
I immediately just dove into having him do an artificial hip a week later. Um, fortunately, two days before I was going to do the artificial hip, um, my wife forced me to talk with a PM&R doctor, and uh, he got me in to see um, an expert ortho orthopedic guy that knows spinal cord injury. And he said, um, in general, if you get an artificial hip, he says, I can guarantee you'll probably lose your leg within a year. Um, just between the soft bone breaking around where they have to put the spike in or maybe fracturing at the end of the spike. So I went with the girdle stone, which fortunately worked out well. Um, and then and flash that, forward. Again, that's a, oh. that's a great example of, you know, That, that guy saved my life, saved my leg. Not, yeah. yeah, not knowing, um, not knowing the, the nuances, the, the things that, are really critical pieces of knowing about someone with a spinal cord injury, and 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 so those are. I mean, the what is a a PM, PMMR doctor? Oh, um, physical medicine and rehab doctor, also known as okay. a physiatrist. So they're so they're now, used to is that neurological a that you problems. Think that, yeah, is that a doctor that you think that someone with a spinal cord injury should really have a relationship with? Oh, absolutely, if at all possible, even a even an online or a phone relationship, um, just to, uh, if they can develop an emergency, um, you know, just something to bounce off with. Um, uh, I don't have it in front of me and we can find it. I will say, like, uh, Craig Hospital has a, a spinal cord nurse hotline number. Um, that's a good resource. Uh, in, right, uh, the care, you know. the, also the Care Cure Forum. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. a fabulous resource for people to be able to join that community and ask questions. And uh, you know, I, and I was up on that community la last night actually, prepping for this, looking for things about osteoporosis because that is something that comes into all of our lives within the first two years after a spinal cord injury, no matter what we're doing. And and uh, there wasn't a ton of information yet up there, so I, I think it's one of the new frontiers that's that's out there. And so we got those couple of um, fractures. Let's just oh, just real quickly though. So, so now, so now yeah, I, want to just, I want to go through the list of because I know you have a few more. Yeah, but, I do uh, quickly. I so then, uh, <laughs> yeah, a couple of years later, um, I was getting ready to teach skiing, and I was up on some really hard packed snow in my wheelchair, throwing a tennis ball for my service dog, and I was just kind of going down a little hill in a wheelie. You know, no big deal. What could be safer and I dropped my front casters, and they caught, and I just kind of fell forward on out of my chair. No big deal. Just kind of a tuck and roll. Um, mm -hmm. and it turned out I broke my femur right above my knee, um, straight across. That um, was exactly and, what Ashley did. And she wasn't throwing yeah. a ball, but she fell forward out of her chair and broke the femur right by the yeah. knee. Yep. And, uh, and then, so, uh, anyway, then getting to the last one, um, <laughs> which is it's, it's a story <laughs> worth telling. Uh, now I know why lawyers say tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because um, uh, I, I also, uh, a couple years after that, I busted my left hip and my left femur, um, and uh, it was so embarrassing. People say, "How'd you do it?" I go, ah, "I did it in a jeep accident. I rolled a jeep." Well, that's the truth. The whole truth is, it was a pink plastic battery operated Barbie Jeep that my young daughter and her cousin were driving around the backyard. And um, I literally told my brother, hey, I've got a great idea. I'll hold my beer. Watch this. And I turned my chair sideways and held on to a little roll bar, plastic roll bar. And I said, hey, girls, hit the gas, and we'll do a burnout like at the drag races, not realizing that uh, it had more traction than I thought. They hit the gas, it yanked my chair sideways, and I did a simple tip over sideways and landed on my hip, which 10 years earlier wouldn't have hurt me at all, um, and, it, and it did a major fracture. So, mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, we've got two hip fractures, two femur fractures, and a, spinal cord, a, a, um, a, a lower spine fracture. Um, yeah, well, and, so, so um, back, well, I want to jump back to the autonomic tetraflexia and thank you so much, Julie, for putting things up there, information about what we have at the Reed Foundation and the cards that people can get. One of the things I want people to keep in mind is 
that level, that acoustic level, is not necessarily so as far as being able to experience autonomic dysreflexia because when I began to get the symptoms, I basically my chair slipped out from underneath me making a transfer, which is what I'm hearing is all daily living activities is really where we go down and break these bones. Uh, it slipped away and my legs slipped underneath me as if I was kneeling on them and as you can see that rod that's in my femur from a femur break, that pushed down on my tibia plateau and that buckled it, my doctor thinks, and that's what created the fractures there. Well, what was happening to me when I went into emergency and they took my blood pressure, it was 195 over 110, which is completely outrageous. And I was shivering, I was feverish, and no one in that intake area thought that that was an unusual blood pressure. And come to find out after speaking to you the next day, because I thought, oh, I'm a low para. I can't really experience any of these things. But any kind of trauma below our level of injury can cause the autonomic dysreflexia to, to start to develop and you know, happen in our systems. And Absolutely. Are, yeah. In fact, I've I've um I've looked at this really carefully and um although it's more common at T6 and above, um right. you're not considered a, a lower motor neuron lesion until you get down into the like the lumbar lower lumbar areas. So even mm -hmm. at even at T11, T12, if it's a really bad stimulus below the level of injury, um right. it's possible. Right, and it and it really was, and 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 another. Thing and it hits that, me too when that stuff happens. Yeah, and the other thing that happened was um, my doctor. When I was able to finally get home, because I wasn't home, I had to fly home. When I was able to get home, and I was still experiencing some of the feverish, shivering type symptoms, he said that there was a thing that happened to people occasionally called bone break fever. So. That and possibly some of the dysreflexia lingering were symptoms of feeling like I had the flu and I was very sick and a little fluttery in my heart rate. And that prompted him then to decide to really look more closely beyond a x-ray and do a CT scan. And so that's me getting a CT scan, which that image in the center of our slide is a CT scan image, which really gives amazing detail to really where the fractures are and what's happening in that area. And, and that would be something I would suggest to anyone with a spinal cord injury who, who has a fracture is to request that because, because that is going to give them a much better idea because they didn't know I actually had a fibula fracture too until they did the CT scan. So um, that was one of those moments when there was uh, some realizations happening that the doctors were thinking, oh, well, just the x-ray is going to be fine. And it really wasn't because our bones are, as you can see, my, my bones are so osteoporotic, they're, they're like ghosts, which is what my, my doctor called them. And uh, so we're, we're consciously working now to, to get them going. But one of the things they wanted to do with me was they wanted to cast me. And I was adamantly against that because I was so fearful of skin skin problems, skin pressure. So one of the things we tried first was a, a brace like this. And uh, and I know this is something that you use. It, it didn't work very well for me, but um, I'd like to hear a little bit about um, your experience with it with your femur, I think it was, correct? Yeah, um, and again, every, <clears throat> every uh, injury is unique. Um, with my femur that was uh, just above the knee, it was straight across and about two inches above the knee, um, this is exactly the kind of brace that they gave me. And um, uh, the, um, well, first, they, first I went to a, a local hospital and they kind of made a, a cast and then they cut it in half um, and um, in, in kind of a bent position so I was able to drive home. Because it was straight across and it was really smooth, there was no danger of anything really bad happening as far as displacement mm -hmm. as long as I was careful with it. Um, so they gave me that with uh, ace bandages. I was able to get home. Then when I got home, 
uh, an orth- they, they sent me to an orthotist and they gave me one of these braces and it was great because I was able to um, keep the um, the injury very stable yet bend the leg enough to um, to get in my chair so I was able to get around in, in my regular chair and um, and as the leg started to heal more with working with my um, uh, orthopedic uh, guy, I was able to, you know, slowly just bend it a little tiny bit more at a time mm-hmm. to make sure that a lot of bone didn't build up in the knee area to um, to limit my my mobility. So that one that one worked really good. Um, the other femur, uh, both different femur fractures. Um, so this area that leg. I just uh, circled right there, that yeah. um, that can. Um, limit your mobility of your knee is that correct exactly yeah there's it's a there's a little allen key and you can adjust it to whatever degree they they set it at where it'll okay it can either lock down or it can go to not bending more than this degree um so it's yeah you know, if you're unlucky enough to have a fracture but lucky enough to have the right kind um it's it's a great brace but every fracture mm-hmm. is unique, and it works for some, it works for exactly. the other, not the other. Right. Other femur right. fractures, I had to be in a soft cast um, with my legs straight out, like you are, in a manual chair, and um, couldn't do like transfers this. without, yeah, I mean, it's just not, it's no fun at all. Um, and uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, but that's that's what I had to do. Um, and, and, the, and again, I was lucky in both of those instances where the doctors did know enough that uh, they said, no, we shouldn't put you in a hard cast because you won't know if you have skin breakdown. Um, I knew that, and I would have told them that Mm -hmm. if that wasn't the answer. Um, I wanted them to, uh, in each instance, I wanted them to put hardware in so I could just go home and get on with my life. um, Right. And in both instances, they said, no, you know, you have really soft bones, and the way the break is, we can't put hardware in that isn't likely to pull out and create more trouble. Um, and again, everybody's different, depending on the femur fracture. The, the femur fracture mm-hmm. you had was perfect for a rod. Um, exactly. The, the real key right. is to find a find a, a, an orthopedic doctor that either A, knows about spinal cord injury, or B, will call up a colleague that knows about mm-hmm. spinal cord injury and ask. Exactly. And that, that is what happened with uh, my femur fracture or 10 years ago was that my doctor called around and found that to be the, the best thing for us to do. And I also wore a brace that I was similar to what you wore on uh, on your leg, this one like that for for that for a while. Um, but one of the mistakes that doctors are are making quite often is that they don't bring the brace into play, so that the person with the spinal cord injury has the support that they need. Because we don't have the hips, we don't have the muscles in the thighs, we don't have the muscles in the glutes to be able to do that. And and I actually came up with the idea of this type of cast bracing system, I call it my giant AFO, because my doctor did want to cast, and I said, no, we can't do that. And even even with using this, that I can open it up and be able to look, and, and we can actually take my leg out every every few days to, to look at it, I still ended up getting some bruising and a wound on the side of my leg right in the beginning, which now is almost gone, which is a, which actually... Now, this is the the, uh, picture that we took about four days ago. This thing is almost completely gone now. And this was all bruising area from the blood that had drifted down from my knee. And and the little bit of pressure that I got created some skin and some skin moisture from the the, uh, plastic. And that created the rubbing of the skin and created this this little this little bit of wound here that now is just about gone um, with the care that we've done with it. So even with a piece of equipment where you can gently take the leg out, have a look, and and put it back, there's still that possibility of skin breakdown. 
But thank goodness you had that. I mean, as you as you say, mm-hmm. imagine if you had been in a regular cast and had that checked uh, three weeks later, um, the nightmare you would have uh, seen. Oh, my gosh, yeah, three weeks. Can you imagine? I mean, and this was only after about four or five days of, yeah. you know, there is, you know, and it really was. It was just the skin getting wet and getting macerated, and then the bruising of the, the blood falling down created this area that opened up the skin. And, and now it's just about gone, but, but still, as you said, the, being able to look at it, which is a critical piece for all of us, just being able to continually look at it because we can't feel this stuff. And, and again, as I said before, we have osteoporosis. We're not going to get around that. And so what are some of the things you're hearing about with some of these drugs that are out there for people to, to be able to take to um, help with osteoporosis or um, limit, limit its action within our bones? Because we're not, most of us aren't weight-bearing. Yeah, um, well, here's, here's the little bit that I know. Um, and, and again, you know, ask your doctor, read the research and everything. But um, the current uh, class of drugs that um, are prescribed to non-disabled people, uh, if I'm pronouncing this right, and I may not be, they're called, uh, I think, biphosphonates. I could have that mm-hmm. really wrong. Things like uh, Fosomax and Boniva and that kind of stuff. Um, right. What they do is normally uh, your bones, the outer bone is constantly shedding bone cells and new bone cells are constantly building up. So you don't have the right. same legs exactly. that you the do 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah, that's the osteoblast and the osteoclast. The, well, the what osteoblast this does, is building. Yep. Yeah, what these bones do, what these drugs do is they stop the outer stuff from shedding. Um, so it stops that process and it makes the bone appear a lot stronger. Um, Uh And statistically, people that are taking these, they cut their fracture risk in half. Um, But it's tough to tell the statistics. It may be if you're aware enough to take this bone stuff, maybe you're already aware enough to be more careful. What they're finding in the long term is it really, really stops the bone turnover. So um, in the long term, they don't know about the quality of the bone. It may be, um, it's, it's very rare, but in the long term, there's people that are taking this that are walking around and their femur just falls in half. Just they, ta- they, they take one step and the other and boom, the femur breaks in half for no reason. Um, Even taking and, the medication. Yeah, um, very rare, but mm-hmm. it does happen. And also even more rare, very, very rare, but uh, there's a thing called osteonecrosis of the jaw, where your your jaw um, basically rots away if you get some kind of an infection or something. Um, and and it's usually when people have taken this intravenously. Uh, point is, I, I was put on this when I was injured in 2000, and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. And I had a, a bone scan two years later, and... and um, uh, uh, you know, out of one out of a hundred percent, my bone density had built up like a couple percent, and it's like, oh yay, you know, helps a little bit. And I thought that was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, the little uh, I've done a lot of research, and the stuff I'm seeing, it appears that in non-disabled people, they're suggesting that um, they take it for maybe five years, and then take a holiday, and don't take it for a while because it stays in your system. Um, for like years and years and years and years, where the bone doesn't turn mm-hmm. over. So, uh, you know, maybe our it it's a real sketchy thing, and I would encourage people to really look into it carefully and really ask their doctors about it carefully. Um, my doctors suggested no, just stay on it for life. That's all we have. But there's statistically there's no evidence that it helps people with spinal cord injuries bones stay stronger. I mean, it's the only thing people okay. have, but there's no evidence uh-huh. that it helps. I stopped taking it, talking to my doctor about it, because I was more concerned about long-term unknown effects with no benefit. So mm-hmm. that's my two cents. Just, right. that, you know, my do opinion. you know of any, any um, do you know of any spinal cord injured research projects going on of people taking any of these? 
these drugs? You know, I, I am not aware of, of anything. And um, uh -huh. the problem is uh, where the big research and the big money is, is you look at uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of non-disabled people taking these drugs versus, uh, I don't know, maybe 10,000 or 5,000 people with spinal cord mm -hmm. injuries taking them. So uh, there just aren't the numbers to study, and there's no real money in it to study. So uh, it, makes it, a, it makes it tough. Yeah, and, and I mean, bone is, a, bone is a living, you know, growing tissue that is just like our skin in the sense that it's, it's building and it's fluffing off. And and that fluffing off of the bone reabsorption when it breaks down and it's removed and goes into the bloodstream and and moves around in there and you know is that a critical piece of of our health and wellness and that being blocked is that that change yeah that I mean that's my concern and the papers I've read that's the concern is they uh, they don't know long term. Um, Again, it, it, for instance, I had some dental surgery a few years ago, and it was all fine, but it, I was as nervous as can be because I had a root canal, which isn't supposed to hurt, and uh, my, my tooth was hurting for months and months later. Well, it turns out it was just the uh, ligaments. But in my mind, I'm sure, you know, my jaw is going to disintegrate. Uh, I've got osteonecrosis of the jaw because I took these drugs, and my uh, ortho. Um, or excuse me, my uh, endodontist, the dentist, was very helpful in saying uh, it's exceedingly rare that this happens. And, it, and again, it only really happens in people that take uh, IV versions of the drug. Uh, but still, it just kind of made me think, okay, I've taken this you know, real powerful drug that stops bones from turning over for 10 years, and um, nobody knows how long it stops the bone from turning over. And right. nobody knows if there's any benefit in spinal cord injury. So yeah, I kind of was making myself my own lab rat. So again, I talked with my doctor, and I just said, I'm, I'm stopping taking this. I, I, I see potential danger, maybe not, but no benefit. Right. And, and, uh, Did that you know, answer your question? I kind of go off on a yeah. tangent. <laughs> no, no, it, it was perfect because there, there really isn't any research. There isn't any studies out there. We're not sure what happens for people with spinal cord injuries. And we all know that, that we are, you know, we're unique in that, one, we can't feel things. And so, or, or we have limited feeling, some of us. And, and so that will limit the way that physicians are able to deal with us because they're used to going off of how people feel. And, you know, and so the, the research isn't out there. But I do know one thing that did and has worked and is working right now for me is the bone healing system, the bone stimulator yes. that I'm using, that I'm wearing 10 hours a day. And it really, we're already seeing, at five weeks we are seeing bone development. And I have a, a picture of my... Um, of my of my latest uh, let's see of my latest X-ray, which uh, is this was five weeks ago, and this one is already showing bone bone development here. We're seeing milky white here. Um, we're even starting to see a tiny bit here where that fracture is, and that I know is a direct result of um, the bone stimulator. And also of uh, my diet, of really paying attention to what I'm eating and drinking. And, and I've got a little bit of information about that that we have here. But I want to talk a little bit about bone stimulator because I know you know it. And, yeah. Um, and I'll tell it's you that out. EBI, you know, one of the things I first want to say is that if you're on Medicare, Medicare wants 90 days of non-healing before they'll, they'll uh, pay for this. But you can go to the companies and you can talk to the companies. And this is what I did. And I got this given to me, what they call a non-rev. And I'm using the bone stimulator and I'm talking about the use of it. And that's all that they're asking is that I talk to my doctor, I show them how it's working, and let people know. And, and so they gave me it at no cost to me. So um, I want to hear about your experience with the bone stimulator. Well, because man, I think and that's this is good for us. Yeah, that's what happened with me as well. Um, my um, the the my second femur fracture um, wasn't showing any healing after five weeks, 
And uh, the doctor said, well, you know, it may not heal. You may just have two knees. <laughs> That's not an option. <laughs> I've heard and that then, story. <laughs> and then he said, you know, you may, we've never tried it in spinal cord injury, folks, but you may try this EBI bone healing system, and I'll explain how it works. Um, and he gave me the sales rep's number. And um, anyway, um, I called him up and explained that I'm a spinal cord injury patient and it's non-healing. And I don't know this, but I suspect that um, here's a new population that they haven't tried the, these right. on. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so now they're, they're looking at them. And uh, so uh, here's what happened. I used it and boom. My legs started healing right away, really fast, as soon as I started using it. Um, my orthopedist told two other orthopedists. I told my uh, physical medicine and rehab doctor at UC Davis. She automatically own, um, orders a bone growth stimulator to anybody that has a major traumatic fracture with a spinal cord injury because it works so well. And it's a real simple system. The way it works is it sends out... Um, a very, very specific electromagnetic pulse, which is the same frequency that your body would send out in a fracture. Um, your body would send out this little tiny uh, pulse telling the brain, hey, send the healing stuff down here. Send all the calcium and stuff down here. Well, this is like a giant, giant speaker screaming at the brain, give me more. Um, I, I, and, and, it, and it really works well. In fact, I was fortunate to, um, I know the doctor that helped do all the studies on this. Um, and he says, yep, it's, it's amazing stuff. It really works. Um, it, it speeds healing. And uh, in fact, uh, there's a famous wheelchair racer that broke his tibia and fibia. He was way out in the boondocks and went to a doctor. And they looked at it. And he said, you know, these things usually don't heal. I would recommend amputation. Um, oh. He immediately jumped on a plane and flew back to Southern California um, and saw this doctor, uh, Dr. Douglas Garland, my hero. Um, and uh, he worked uh, with a brace and everything, getting him to heal, and then it didn't heal. And then he got on one of these bone growth stimulators. This was after months, and it ended mm -hmm. up healing fully. So, yeah, um, yeah. an amazing, I've amazing deal. I've only used the simulator for three weeks now of my five of of really of the first two weeks I didn't have it yet. So within three weeks we were starting to see bone healing and uh and my doctor is very, very surprised. He said, In my non disabled patients I would do that, uh, without the stimulator. He said, So for you I'm very surprised by that and and I, I, I think he's he's going to be become a, a, a fan of the bone stimulator. Well, the other thing, too, that I have been doing that I know is making a huge difference is um, my sister turned me on to a recipe called bone broth, and basically it, it's cooking chicken bones that in a crock pot down with uh, some apple cider vinegar in it to leach out all the minerals, and I'm drinking that once a day. I'm also juicing parsley, celery, dandelion greens, carrots, and apples, and having eight ounces of that every day. And all those things in the juice that I just described have that list. There are the calcium, vitamin K, zinc, magnesium, manganese, and the potassium. And these are all things that you, know, you can begin to eat food. We can all begin to eat food that, that is very high in this. The canned salmon or salmon has the calcium in it, it has all the other stuff, the K, the zinc, there's all kinds of seeds and oh, can, I, can I throw one quick it? thing in there? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, uh, along with calcium, uh, the, the orthopedic doctor that I spoke with said the most important thing you can do is get the proper amount of vitamin D. Um, and the easiest yes. way to do that is 15 minutes in, um, in sunlight. No more than 15, just 15 minutes yeah. in the sunlight a day um, or uh, 4,000 units of vitamin D a day if it's winter time or if you live in higher yep. northern latitudes. And you, um, thank you. sunscreen thank you. blocks vitamin yeah. D, so you know, 15 minutes without sunscreen. Well, and you know what? Thank you for, for saying that, and I forgot to put it in the list, vitamin D3, because um, what 
I was encouraged to do years and years ago was to get a yearly blood panel done to find out what my levels are with all the different vitamins, minerals, my, you know, my glucose, my cholesterol, all of those things. And we started testing the vitamin D3, and they found that I was very sufficient, uh, deficient in it. So we started adding it, and that is a critical piece of it. Majority of people are deficient in uh, vitamin D3. So thank you for bringing that back up. I totally neglected that on the slide, and and it's a, it's a critical piece of the equation because. Uh, if you buy, you got all the ones that I didn't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we make a great team. And yeah. then the trace minerals, I I put that in a, a little bit of water and drink it down, and it is the most horrible tasting thing I have ever tasted in my life. It is like doing a shot of tequila, and you need to bite the lemon right away because it is so nasty. But it gets the job done. So the other thing is more protein. Adding more protein to my diet. I needed to do that because uh, they said when you're healing bones, that that's a critical piece of, of being able to heal things. And and if anybody wants the recipe for bone broth or uh, the guidelines of the foods to eat, of the things that I was talking about here, uh, these different vitamins and minerals, we can make that available. My latest blog has the bone broth recipe in it, and that's called uh, Nourishing My Ghost Bones. And uh, I'm going to be working with Julie to, I have a PDF of this guidelines, dietary guidelines for um, the food that you can eat with this, these kinds of things in it, which are super critical. And because you want to eat food when you take any kind of, any kind of supplements. And the other thing is get a blood test done because you might not be low in some of these things and, and it's really can hurt you if you're taking something that you don't need. So it's, it's a real, it's a real important piece of the equation is Really making sure you're you're taking what you need, and um, and so and and actually, Candice, I like your your photos here because um, it's although it's kind of difficult. Um, everybody I speak with, all the doctors I speak with, and certainly you say this all the time. The most amazing best way to get vitamins is with food. That's how your body mm -hmm. absorbs them the best. Um, mm -hmm. Supplements are great, but a lot of that can get just washed out. I'm not saying don't take supplements, but there's no substitute for uh, vitamins through food. Absolutely, and I appreciate you pointing that out because the other thing that we need to make sure we don't do is take things like caffeine at the same time as we're trying to get our calcium and our zinc and our vitamin K and all these things because caffeine actually helps block it. And you know, it is one of those things that you got to do your timing right. And so getting your vitamins and minerals as food, if you take supplements, take those along with your food. And then also don't take high doses of sugar or salt or caffeine at the time that you're doing that because those will all block your ability to absorb these precious minerals that, you know, for us, spinal cord injured people who are not weight-bearing, we really need to be able to hold on every single little bit that we have. And and so I know I want to try to open up the lines because we have about six minutes left. Um, and I'm just going to throw a little uh, a little picture here of me and a couple of my MacGyver things that I'm doing. Uh, Dog Leash was helping me pick my leg up and be able to move it around effortlessly. And uh, that's a super helpful thing that my, my doctor gave me. And... Uh, and then in the shower, you know, I I put a block uh, put a box in there and wrapped my my leg with plastic, and um, I'm able to be able to take showers sitting on a shower chair. So, and honestly, with this long leg cast on, I am unable to get on the toilet myself. I'm unable to get into the shower myself. Uh, I'm unable to drive. So I'm very dependent on caregivers, and I'm so appreciative of all the people that have been stepping up and helping me do the things that I need to get done to be able to get through this healing cycle that I'm in. And and that is a part of, I think, our lives as people with disabilities is that we, we create this community that helps support us and then we help support them. So um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, Phyllis, um, I think if anybody has any questions, 
we could open up the phone lines. All lines are open. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, until we have, this was one of the slides I had of Bob that uh, for some reason they decided to jump somewhere else in the uh, sequence. But uh, you can see Bob is a very active sailor, kayaker. And uh, even with all the those. The kayak tracks, photo was a, a seven day kayak trip from uh, Seattle up to uh, Vancouver through the, the San Juan Islands. That was a pretty amazing trip. Yeah, I remember that story. And then the other one I had of you that ran away was uh, you skiing and and uh, and flying the ultralights and. Oh, and then that and, uh, was uh, an adventure race. Go, I was zip lining over the Colorado River. <laughs> mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Just before accidentally, yeah. not intentionally, swimming through a stre stretch of Class Four rapids when my raft flipped. <laughs> oh, oh. So we have a raised hand. No, hey. how do we, Julie, how do we do that? So, um, if, if manual and, um, manual you may, if you, are you able to, to speak? Are you on a, a microphone phone? Um, if not manual, go ahead and type your question into the chat box. There we go. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, and also, um, you know, again, here we go. Um, Adrian had a question. Uh, when did you become paralyzed? Uh, I was, this is Candace, I was in 1975. I had a spinal cord injury, and Bob had a spinal cord injury in 1985. Is that right? Yeah, and actually, I think Adrian's uh, was, mine was a, a ski crash. Um, I went off a jump too high and too far and over somersaulted. Um, and, mm -hmm. and Candace, how what how did yours? Oh, I was in a car accident. Yeah, I was in a a jeep and it flipped and I fell out. So, um, pretty pretty uneventful, simple. <laughs> eventful for you though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very eventful for me, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and so this is pretty much uh, the. Picture on the left is my ride. I have one of those folding wheelchairs that you, you get from the hospital, and the narrowest one I could get was the 16 inch, which is still a little bit too big for me. But um, I have my leg extended out, and and my uh, I just finished six weeks, so my doctor says we're doing very well. Um, and we're gonna I visit him once a week so that we can take X-rays and look at everything. But um, it's a very laborious process. Um, I don't, if you're going to break a bone, don't do the tibia plateau. <laughs> oh, and I yeah. like you have a uh, the photo on the right. That's the dreaded um, little uh, lever that will cause mm -hmm. the entire elevated footrest to drop if somebody knocks against it by chance. Absolutely, and it has no lock on it, which is completely bizarre to me. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a question here, Bob. It says, oh, is using yeah. a standing frame beneficial to the bones? I use it twice a week for an hour. I'm a C6 quad, spinal cord injury in 2010. So uh, I mean, I, I can kind of speak to that. Um, I, the, um, the, first of all, absolutely using a standing frame is beneficial to the body, for sure. It's beneficial to everything. It's beneficial to the joints, to the tendons. To digestion, to everything, um, you know. In a perfect world, you would want to load your bones up um, for f four or five hours a day, um, mm -hmm. uh, which you, you know you're not going to be standing in a standing frame for four or five hours a day, um, if possible. If you could in could increase that more, um, I know it's a big deal, but um, the, the more that you can use it, the better. And um, you know, of all the studies they've done, uh, if anything, it, it is a little bit helpful. But the more that you can use it, the better. I hope that answers that. And it looks like I don't know if this is a question. Oh, it looks like there is a question here. Um, mm -hmm. All right, I have. Like um, okay. I have yeah, okay. let's see. What is that bump? He has. Uh, he has. He has two little bumps on both sides of his hips. The one on the right side is bigger than the left, and the doctor told me it could be that the cushion uh, I have is might be the 
successful and you gave me antibiotics but haven't gone down. It's already been five months. Have you guys heard of or dealt with anything like this? Well, I, not not being a doctor, I'm, I'm not a doctor, right. but I would certainly right. ask a doctor, um, I would ask a doctor if it's appropriate to get an x-ray because what I have heard of happening is um, uh, bone growths, uh, b growths of bone around the bone, mm -hmm. anywhere from hips to whatever, um, and I'm drawing a mental block on the name of it right now, um, yeah, but uh, it, it, hopefully it isn't that, but it's something that um, I would ask your doctor if it's appropriate to get x-rayed. Um, oh, I think you probably know what I'm talking about as well, Candace, because we've had friends that have had this, and I just can't think of it. <laughs> oh, is it a, a calcification type thing? Yeah, exactly. It's a calcification around the, the hip bones, and um, it's um, the uh, osteo something. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, it is osteo something. You're right, exactly. And uh, yeah, definitely, that's good advice. The uh, getting a, an X-ray so you can have a little look at it, and um, because if it's if it was an infection and and you've taken antibiotics and it hasn't gotten down, oh, it says you did get X-rays and everything came out okay. Oh, so that's fantastic. I wonder, okay. I wonder if it's a cyst then, or you know, some kind of fluid buildup. That is I, I would certainly, um, again, not being doctors, I would pursue it right. more from your doctors and get an answer, including mm -hmm. finding out that, oh, we found out that it's nothing. Well, good, then you know it's nothing and it's officially nothing. But, um, you know, our bodies normally don't just get that for no reason. Oh, there we go. We got an answer to the het heterotrophic oscillation. Oh, thank you. That was it. <laughs> that, that was it. Thank you, audience. No, you guys thank, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so so much, and thank you everyone for for attending this webinar. And it really is important information that we all need to get more of of how we can take care of our bones because because these fractures uh, they just happen too easily, especially in our daily living activities, and and we really need to be self advocates. We've got to educate ourselves about our bodies, really pay attention, and then, and then when a doctor is not paying attention, you have to do everything you can to get his attention or her attention. And if you can't, then actually, I, I could just throw in a little mm -hmm. good news, bad news. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I, in all the research that I've written about um, osteoporosis, the good news is the average person with a spinal cord injury, their lower spine gets a little stronger, a little stronger than the average mm -hmm. person over time. Mm -hmm. But the average person's uh, hit legs, um, and the farther down you go, um, after the first year, they lose 20 to 25 percent. Out of 100 percent, they lose 20 to 25 percent of the bone in their legs. And then about you know one to two percent after that. So your average paraplegic after 20 years, you know they've got pretty severe osteoporosis. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then there's oh, a, a, a subset of like 20 percent of people that nobody knows why are lucky that that doesn't happen to. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm also uh, hearing some some feedback, and I, I want to get some people on the show about this that have had rods for a very long time that are starting to come off uh, the vertebrae and causing collapsing of the area and um, starting to see yeah. people that are going to need that are needing surgeries and and to be readjusted. So so that's that's another show I want to do to be able to talk about some of this more and everybody to find Bob's work. New mobility is just, there's. He's there. NewMobility.com. Yeah. So the, the He's there. Word, NewMobility.com. And if you have questions for him, he can be reached through there. And really, thank you so much, Bob, for being my guest. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. And Julie, thank you. I know you're going to take us out. And um, Phyllis, thank you. I want to definitely thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I learned so much, and I love the um, participation from the, the people who um, 
have joined us today. That really helped a lot. So again, um, newmobility.com to read more um, from Bob Vogel. I love his work. Very personal and it's very easy to understand and he makes it very relatable. So thank you, Bob, for all of that. And Candace, you just do an excellent job as filling the hour. It didn't seem to go by so fast. I know, our time. <laughs> we don't have enough. It's crazy. It's like, well, I know people want questions, but you know, it's so good. <laughs> Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us, and this is being recorded and archived, and it will be up by the end of the week, and you can go to ChristopherReeve.org slash webcasts, ChristopherReeve.org slash webcasts, and um, all of the archived webinars, webcasts are there. So thank you for joining us today, and have a good rest.